Section 27 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1, Section 27. Selected Poems by Mark Akenside. Mark Akenside, seventeen twenty one to seventeen seventy. Mark Akenside is of less importance in genuine poetic rank than in literary history. He was technically a real poet, but he had not a great, a spontaneous, nor a fertile poetical mind. Nevertheless, a writer who gave pleasure to a generation cannot be set aside. The fact that the mid-eighteenth century ranked him among its foremost poets is interesting and still significant. It determines the poetic standard and product of that age, and the fact that, judged thus, Akenside was fairly entitled to his fame. He was the son of a butcher, born November ninth, 1721, in Newcastle-on-Tyne, whence Eldon and Stowell also sprang. He attracted great attention by an early poem, The Virtuoso. The citizens of that commercial town have always appreciated their great men and valued intellectual distinction, and its dissenters sent him at their own expense to Edinburgh to study for the Presbyterian ministry. A year later he gave up theology for medicine, honorably repaying the money advanced for his divinity studies, if obviously out of someone else's pocket. After some struggle in provincial towns, his immense literary reputation, for at twenty-four he was a star of the first magnitude in Great Britain, and the generosity of a friend enabled him to acquire a fashionable London practice. He wrote medical treatises, which at the time made him a leader in his profession, secured a rich clientage, and prospered greatly. In 1759 he was made physician to Christ's Hospital, where, however valued professionally, he is charged with being brutal and offensive to the poor, with indulging his fastidiousness, temper, and pomposity, and with forgetting that he owed anything to mere duty or humanity. Unfortunately, too, Ekenside availed himself of that mixture of complacence and arrogance by which almost alone a man of no birth can rise in society graded by birth. He concealed his origin and was ashamed of his pedigree. But the blame for his flunkeyism belongs perhaps less to him than to the insolent caste feeling of society, which forced it on him as a measure of self-defense and of advancement. He wanted money, loved place, and selfish comfort, and his nature did not balk at the means of getting them, including living on a friend when he did not need such help. To become physician to the queen, he turned his coat from Whig to Tory, but no one familiar with the politics of the time will regard this as an unusual offense. It must also be remembered that Ekenside possessed a delicate constitution, keen senses, and irritable nerves, and that he was a parvenu, lacking the power of self-control even among strangers. These traits explain, though they do not excuse, his bad temper to the unclean and disagreeable patients of the hospital, and they mitigate the fact that his industry was paralyzed by material prosperity, and his self-culture interfered with by conceit. His early and sweeping success injured him, as many a greater man has been thus injured. Moreover, his temper was probably soured by secret bitternesses, his health, his nerves, and entire absence of the sense of humor, and his lack of repartee made him shun like Pope and Horace Walpole the bibulous and gluttonous element of eighteenth-century British society, for its brutal horseplay and uncivil practical joking which passed for wit, Akenside had no tolerance, yet he felt unwilling to go where he would be outshone by inferior men. His strutty arrogance of manner like excessive prudery in a woman, 
may have been a fortification to a garrison too weak to fight in the open field and it must be admitted that as so often happens akenside's outward ensemble was eminently what the vulgar world terms guyable he was not a little of a fop he was plain-featured and yet assuming in manner he hobbled in walking from lameness of tell-tale origin a cleaver falling on his foot in childhood compelling him to wear an artificial heel and he was morbidly sensitive over it his prim formality of manner his sword and stiff curled wig his small and sickly face trying to maintain an expression impressively dignified made him a ludicrous figure which his contemporaries never tired of ridiculing and caricaturing henderson the actor said that Akenside, when he walked the streets looked for all the world like one of his own alexandrines set upright smollett even used him as a model for the pedantic doctor in peregrine pickle who gives a dinner in the fashion of the ancients and dresses each dish according to humorous literary recipes but there were those who seemed to have known an inner and superior personality beneath the brusqueness conceit and policy beyond the nerves and fears and they valued it greatly at least on the intellectual side a wealthy and amiable young londoner jeremiah dyson remained a friend so enduring and admiring as to give the poet a house in bloomsbury square with three hundred pounds a year and a chariot and personally to extend his medical practice we cannot suppose this to be a case of patron and parasite other men of judgment showed like esteem and in congenial society akenside was his best and therefore truest self he was an easy and even brilliant talker displaying learning and immense memory taste and philosophic reflection and as a volunteer critic he has the unique distinction of a man who had what books he liked given him by the publishers for the sake of his oral comments the standard edition of akenside's poems is that edited by alexander dice london eighteen thirty five few of them require notice here his early effort the virtuoso was merely an acknowledged and servile imitation of spencer the claim made by the poet's biographers that he preceded thompson in reintroducing the spencerian stanza is groundless pope preceded him and thompson renewed its popularity by being the first to use it in a poem of real merit the castle of indolence mr gosse calls the hymn to the naiads beautiful of transcendent merit perhaps the most elegant of his productions the epistle to curio however must be held his best poem doubtless because it is the only one which came from his heart and even its merit is much more in rhetorical energy than in art or beauty as to its allusion and object the real and classic curio of roman social history was a protege of cicero's a rich young senator who began as a champion of liberty and then sold himself to caesar to pay his debts in akenside's poem curio represents william pulteney walpole's antagonist the hope of that younger generation who hated walpole's system of parliamentary corruption and official jobbing this party had looked to pulteney for a clean and public-spirited administration their hero was carried to a brief triumph on the wave of their enthusiasm but pulteney disappointed them bitterly he took a peerage and sunk into utter and permanent political damnation with no choice but walpole's methods and tools no policy save walpole's to redeem the withdrawal of so much lofty promise and no aims but personal advancement from akenside's address to him the famous epistle to curio a citation is made below akenside's fame however rests on the pleasures of the imagination he began it at seventeen though in the case of works begun in childhood it is safer to accept the date of finishing as the year of the real composition he published it six years later in seventeen forty four on the advice and with the warm admiration of pope 
a man never wasteful of encomiums on the poetry of his contemporaries it raised its author to immediate fame it secures him a place among the accepted english classics still yet neither its thought nor its style makes the omission to read it any irreparable loss it is cultivated rhetoric rather than true poetry its chief merit and highest usefulness are that it suggested two far superior poems campbell's pleasures of hope and rogers's pleasures of memory it is the relationship to these that really keeps Egginsides alive. In scope, the poem consists of 2,000 lines of blank verse. It is distributed in three books. The first defines the sources, methods, and results of imagination. The second, its distinction from philosophy and its enchantment by the passions. The third sets forth the power of imagination to give pleasure and illustrates its mental operation. The author remodeled the poem in 1757, but it is generally agreed that he injured it. Macaulay says he spoiled it, and another critic delightfully observes that he stuffed it with intellectual horsehair. The year of Akenside's death, 1770, gave birth to Wordsworth. The freer and nobler natural school of poetry came to supplant the artificial one, belonging to an epoch of wigs and false calves and to open toward the far greater one of the romanticism of Scott and Byron. From the Epistle to Curio With this earlier and finer form of Akenside's address to the unstable Pulteney, see biographical sketch above, must not be confused its later embodiment among his odes, of which it is nine to Curio much of its thought and diction were transferred to the ode named but the latter by no means happily compares with the original epistle both versions however are of the same year seventeen forty four thrice has the spring beheld thy faded fame and the fourth winter rises on thy shame since i exulting grasped the votive shell in sounds of triumph all thy praise to tell blessed could my skill through ages make thee shine and proud to mix my memory with thine but now the cause that waked my song before with praise with triumph crowns the toil no more if to the glorious man whose faithful cares nor quelled by malice nor relaxed by years had awed ambition's wild audacious hate and dragged at length corruption to her fate if every tongue its large applauses owed and well-earned laurels every muse bestowed if public justice urged the high reward and freedom smiled on the devoted bard say then to him whose levity or lust laid all a people's generous hopes in dust who taught ambition firmer heights of power and saved corruption at her hopeless hour does not each tongue its execrations owe shall not each muse a wreath of shame bestow and public justice sanctify the award and freedom's hand protect the impartial bard there are who say they viewed without amaze the sad reverse of all thy former praise that through the pageants of a patriot's name they pierced the foulness of thy secret aim or deem thy arm exalted but to throw the public thunder on a private foe but i whose soul consented to thy cause who felt thy genius stamp its own applause who saw the spirits of each glorious age move in thy bosom and direct thy rage i scorned the ungenerous gloss of slavish minds the owl-eyed race whom virtue's lustre blinds spite of the learned in the ways of vice and all who prove that each man has his price i still believed thy end was just and free and yet even yet believe it spite of thee even though thy mouth impure has dared disclaim urged by the wretched impotence of shame whatever filial cares thy zeal had paid to laws infirm and liberty decayed has begged ambition to forgive the show, has told corruption thou wert ne'er her foe, 
has boasted in thy country's awful ear her gross delusion when she held thee dear how tame she followed thy tempestuous call and heard thy pompous tales and trusted all rise from your sad abodes ye cursed of old for laws subverted and for cities sold paint all the noblest trophies of your guilt the oaths you perjured and the blood you spilt yet must you one untempted vileness own one dreadful palm reserved for him alone with studied arts his country's praise to spurn to beg the infamy he did not earn to challenge hate when honor was his due and plead his crimes where all his virtue knew when they who loud for liberty and laws in doubtful times had fought their country's cause when now of conquest and dominion sure they sought alone to hold their fruit secure when taught by these oppression hid the face to leave corruption stronger in her place by silent spells to work the public fate and taint the vitals of the passive state till healing wisdom should avail no more and freedom loath to tread the poison shore then like some guardian god that flies to save the weary pilgrims from an instant grave whom sleeping and secure the guileful snake steals nearer and nearer through the peaceful break then curio rose to ward the public woe to wake the heedless and incite the slow against corruption liberty to arm and quell the enchantress by a mightier charm lo the deciding hour at last appears the hour of every freeman's hopes and fears see freedom mounting her eternal throne the sword submitted and the laws her own see public power chastised beneath her stands with eyes intent and uncorrupted hands see private life by wisest arts reclaimed see ardent youth to noblest manners framed see us acquire whate'er was sought by you if curio only curio will be true was then o oh shame o oh trust how ill repaid o oh latium oft by faithless sons betrayed twas then what frenzy on thy reason stole what spells unsinewed thy determined soul is this the man in freedom's cause approved the man so great so honored so beloved this patient slave by tinsel chains allured this wretched suitor for a boon abjured this curio hated and despised by all who fell himself to work his country's fall o oh, lost alike to action and repose unknown unpitied and the worst of woes with all that conscious undissembled pride sold to the insults of a foe defied with all that habit of familiar fame doomed to exhaust the dregs of life in shame the sole sad refuge of thy baffled art to act a statesman's dull exploded part renounce the praise no longer in thy power display thy virtue though without a dower contemn the giddy crowd the vulgar wind and shut thy eyes that others may be blind o long revered and late resigned to shame if this uncourtly page thy notice claim when the loud cares of business are withdrawn nor well-dressed beggars round thy footsteps fawn in that still thoughtful solitary hour when truth exerts her unresisted power breaks the false optics tinged with fortune's glare unlocks the breast and lays the passions bare then turn thy eyes on that important scene and ask thyself if all be well within where is the heartfelt worth and weight of soul which labor could not stop nor fear control where the known dignity the stamp of awe which half abashed the proud and venal saw where the calm triumphs of an honest cause where the delightful taste of just applause where the strong reason the commanding tongue on which the senate fired or trembling hung all vanish all are sold and in their room 
couched in thy bosom's deep distracted gloom see the pale form of barbarous grandeur dwell like some grim idol in a sorcerer's cell to her in chains thy dignity was led at her polluted shrine thy honour bled with blasted weeds thy awful brow she crowned thy powerful tongue with poisoned filters bound that baffled reason straight indignant flew and fair persuasion from her seat withdrew for now no longer truth supports thy cause no longer glory prompts thee to applause no longer virtue breathing in thy breast with all her conscious majesty confessed still brighter and brighter wakes the almighty flame to rouse the feeble and the wilful tame and where she sees the catching glimpses roll spreads the strong blaze and all involves the soul but cold restraints thy conscious fancy chill and formal passions mock thy struggling will or if thy genius e'er forget his chain and reach impatient at a nobler strain soon the sad bodings of contemptuous mirth shoot through thy breast and stab the generous birth till blind with smart from truth to frenzy tossed and all the tenor of thy reason lost perhaps thy anguish drains a real tear while some with pity some with laughter hear ye mighty foes of liberty and rest give way do homage to a mightier guest ye daring spirits of the roman race see curio's toil your proudest claims efface awed at the name fierce appius rising bends and hardy senna from his throne attends he comes they cry to whom the fates assigned with surer arts to work what we designed from year to year the stubborn herd to sway mouth all their wrongs and all their rage obey till owned their guide and trusted with their power he mocked their hopes in one decisive hour then tired and yielding led them to the chain and quenched the spirit we provoked in vain but thou supreme by whose eternal hands fair liberty's heroic empire stands whose thunders the rebellious deep control and quell the triumphs of the traitor's soul o oh, turn this dreadful omen far away on freedom's foes their own attempts repay relume her sacred fires so near suppressed and fix her shrine in every roman breast though bold corruption boast around the land let virtue if she can my baits withstand though bolder now she urged the accursed claim gay with her trophies raised on curio's shame yet some there are who scorn her impious mirth who know what conscience and a heart are worth aspirations after the infinite from pleasures of the imagination who that from alpine heights his laboring eye shoots round the wide horizon to survey nilus or ganges rolling his bright wave through mountains plains through empires black with shade and continents of sand will turn his gaze to mark the windings of a scanty rill that murmurs at his feet the high-born soul disdains to rest her heaven-aspiring wing beneath its native quarry tired of earth and this diurnal scene she springs aloft through fields of air pursues the flying storm rides on the volleyed lightning through the heavens or yoked with whirlwinds and the northern blast sweeps the long tract of day then high she soars the blue profound and hovering round the sun beholds him pouring the redundant stream of light beholds his unrelenting sway bend the reluctant planets to absolve the fated rounds of time thence far effused she darts her swiftness up the long career of devious comets through its burning signs exulting measures the perennial wheel of nature and looks back on all the stars whose blended light as with a milky zone invests the orient 
now amazed she views the imperial waste where happy spirits hold beyond this concave heaven their calm abode and fields of radiance whose unfading light has travelled the profound six thousand years nor yet arrived in sight of mortal things even on the barriers of the world untired she meditates the eternal depth below till half recoiling down the headlong steep she plunges soon o'erwhelmed and swallowed up in that immense of being there her hopes rest at the fated goal for from the birth of mortal man the sovereign maker said that not in humble nor in brief delight nor in the fading echoes of renown powers purple robes nor pleasure's flowery lap the soul should find enjoyment but from these turning disdainful to an equal good through all the ascent of things enlarge her view till every bound at length should disappear and infinite perfection close the scene on a sermon against glory come then tell me sage divine is it an offence to own that our bosoms e'er incline toward immortal glory's throne for with me nor pomp nor pleasure bourbon's might braganza's treasure so can fancy's dream rejoice so conciliate reason's choice as one approving word of her impartial voice if to spurn at noble praise be the passport to thy heaven follow thou those gloomy ways no such law to me was given nor i trust shall i deplore me faring like my friends before me nor an holier place desire than timoleon's arms acquire and tully's curled chair and milton's golden lyre End of section 27, recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio.